Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask a Wizard. Today, we are going to be talking about the philosophy of the wizard. We will be discussing Carl Jung, hallucinations, and why everyone in the world is religious. Now, thank you for tuning in, everybody. I've been uh, going to the Magic Castle. You may have seen me performing there. I go in on Tuesdays. You can come and visit me, and if you are part of the super secret group, you can uh, email me, text me. You probably have my number and i have a limited number of people i can get in on my guest list one is always dedicated to the beautiful amazing opv is also known as alex paxton but that leaves four available for you guys so if you'd like to come in and see my show and take a night out at the magic castle on a tuesday which i don't know it's, it's rough but that's when i go so if you'd like to do that let me know but i have been getting a question a lot lately which is uh I've been performing, doing some private shows, working at the Magic Castle, and I talk about the wizard philosophy. <clears throat> and a lot of people are interested in learning more about it and talking about it, and I give them a brief discussion about the topic uh, while we're talking, but obviously I have to move on and do other shows, work with other groups, especially in the private show setting. It's like I have five to ten minutes to work a room or work a table, and then I got to go to another table because I'm getting paid to do it. <laughs> um, so this presentation I put together is kind of an overview to kind of explain that idea for you. So in a way, this is uh, useful if you're interested in learning the wizard philosophy right now, you uh, will be able to understand it. But also this will act as a reference, which I'll upload to YouTube that I'll be able to reference for you if you want to learn more about what I do and uh, follow along. And furthermore, this is, I believe, the first time we've had the stream up, running, and working, and fully promoted to the Owls. So I'm really excited to uh, welcome the Parliament of Owls. Thank you for joining us. Uh, feel free to drop your comments in the comment section below. I won't probably respond to them right away. I'm going to try and get through the lecture here. I'll check in every now and then, but I'll answer my questions at the end. So if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns, feel free to drop them in the comment section, and I will check them out. So moving right along. Let me see if we can get this presentation to work flawlessly today. Uh, grab my keyboard here. Makes it more useful to uh, accomplish what I'm trying to do. And... Do, 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 do. Get my windowed projector here. There, we can see that. And here we go. So, <clears throat> a brief overview for today. In this class, what I'm going to be teaching is about Carl Jung's The Red Book. It's a... Uh, an interesting book, really. We'll, we'll get into it in more detail, obviously. Um, but uh, very fascinating. It's the core of his work, yet it wasn't released until 2009. Very, very weird. And we'll talk about why. Uh, we're going to talk about how you and everyone hallucinates your reality, what you call reality. We're going to explain how Carl Jung's Red Book and the fact that you hallucinate reality has impacted science we're going to learn the two wizard solutions or the two paths that wizards have discovered throughout the centuries of philosophizing and studying this topic. And finally, as with all educational material, you'll be learning how to apply this knowledge for yourself in the real life, because there's no point in learning anything if you can't apply it. Schools teach you knowledge for no reason. That's because they're not trying to educate you. College is a scam. Don't go. Never can emphasize that enough. All right, moving right along, let's talk about Carl Jung's The Red Book. So a brief overview. Carl Jung first drafted The Red Book in 1917, but it was not published until 2009. Despite it being the central formation of his work, it took his scientific uh, logic-based real-world research work and combined it with uh, creativity and actual experimental acting out the work, if you will, the right brain and the left brain coming together into a formation. And that was why it was called the Red Book, actually, is he had the Black Book, which uh, represented the first stone in the Philosopher's Stone, which he then uh, transmuted into the Red Book, the Red Stone. And that was kind of the idea he was trying to model there. Um, the process this book was documenting the solidification of the left and the right coming together. So this is the left brain and the right brain uh, working together to reveal that there is truth in both sides of the equation. Now, what does that mean? It's, it's very complicated. So if you're not familiar with Carl Jung's work, 
um, a constant back and forth of what he was trying to discuss is that there is two different ways of perceiving the world. And there is the left brain approach, the logical approach. This is the objective world, the, the tangible world. And there is a second dimension, the right brain, which is the, the place that when you dream and um, use your imagination and artistic pursuits. And he argued that the right brain world is equally true to the objective world. It's just two different dimensions. And so to say one is correct and one is not is a, a false understanding of what truth is. Um, Christians would call this logos, the, the, the truth, the light, the way. It's not truth. It's a super truth. It's above truth. Um, and what the Red Book did, and this is why he delayed it, was it actually revealed that the right brain world that we're constantly being bombarded all the time with our media today doesn't exist, does in fact exist. And he went in with his extraordinary IQ and his incredible imagination and his extremely specialized research onto this topic and explored the right brain dimension. And that's what the Red Book was all about. So to avoid the political scandal of being attacked and put down and having all of his work uh, destroyed and hidden, which we'll talk about later in the scientific community, happens a lot. When you go against the religion of science, uh, they tend to discredit you, uh, slander you, and hide your work and ruin your name. They still did that to him, but uh, he was attempting to avoid that slaughter by holding this book back and giving a buffer of time. Once a certain amount of time had passed, the book was released, and he felt that that separation would make his um, research work that would impact science, which it has. Most of uh, what we think of as psychology was created by Jung and Freud. And so he was, he was seminal in that way. And he was able to uh, buffer the fact that the right brain world is real by delaying the book's production. More or less, what its fundamental core revelation was is that this concept of objective truth being the truth truth, the logos, if you will, is mostly a comforting lie that we tell ourselves and not the other way around where people would say that the right brain world is the comforting lie. It was uh, in direct contradiction to what Freud believed. So this topic here, this, this concept, if you will, is startling for a lot of people who are, are kind of um, in the modern day consuming our current culture because we're taught every single day that um, objective reality is true, it's real, science has the answers, we know what's going on, and everyone's got, the, there's a pretty coherent story, there's a few questions here or there that science is working on, but, you know, science is a process, and we're getting closer and closer, ever closer to uh, truth. The reality is that the main findings that are legitimate and repeatable in psychology is we're discovering what are called cognitive biases. So cognitive biases, as you can see here, is a, um, this is a nice little graph. I actually have it framed in my house, in my living room. Um, it lists off a variety of cognitive biases that your brain has. Magicians study these and use these all the time because most of our magic tricks are about finding ways that you hallucinate the world and then we exploit them to do a magic effect. So what a cognitive bias is, is basically a part, um, a, a way that your brain functions, and I'm trying to get this into simplistic terms here, but a way that your brain functions that allows you to feel like you're living in this movie, this experience that you have, um, with the least amount of processing power possible. So rather than seeing reality, which is an essentially infinite amount of information coming at you all the time, you take a very small sliver of that data, you hierarchically prioritize that information, and you say, what is most important in my environment at this time? And then the rest of that data is filtered, the majority of it is filtered out, and the small amount that isn't filtered out goes through these cognitive biases that are essentially small little hallucinations and heuristics of 
oh yeah yeah that's most of the time that's what happens oh yeah yeah most of the time this is what this is happening and that whole thing gets molded together into what you guys call your everyday experience and reality and your brain is doing this all the time and i'll give you some examples right here of what that looks like let me just uh pull this up real quick boom did that break everything did it break everything no 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 we're good all right so these are some examples of cognitive biases. You may have heard of these. Um, they're becoming more uh, popular and aware because uh, people are starting to realize um, that because of the way the political spectrum is uh, breaking down right now, people are starting to realize that uh, there's a huge group of people out there that don't see the reality the way I do. So what, what's going on? Are they all crazy? They can't all be crazy because they're, there's a lot of them and they, they seem to be pretty successful and make lots of money. So, so what, what's going on? Well, the, the fact is, is they are hallucinating and you are too. <laughs> you both are. Uh, we all are, I should say. And the most common one you probably have heard is confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is one of the most commonly exploited ones by magicians as well. You can actually experience this right now. I'll give you an example of this. <clears throat> Um, have you ever noticed that there's a lot of blue in your room? It's, it's strange. People with higher IQs tend to have lots of blue in their room. And you happen to have a lot of blue because you're listening to this podcast. And people who are in the Parliament of Owls tend to have higher IQs. And that's why there's a lot of blue in your room right now. And as you look around, you might notice that most people would only have like 1% of their objects being blue. But you'll find that maybe 5, 10% are actually blue as you look around in your environment now. And as you look around, you'll start to notice that there's a lot of items in your house that are blue that you didn't realize before, but you can now see that they're there. Now, why is that? Is it because you really are high IQ? Well, unfortunately, no. Blue isn't correlated with high IQ. <laughs> I mean, you might be. You might be a smarter person, but it, would, it isn't because of the blue. What I did there was I primed your mind with a piece of information, in this case, the color blue. And then I gave you an incentive to find the color blue in your environment more than normal. So because you did that, your brain will now go and look in your environment and try to find the information that confirms that belief. That's confirmation bias. So that's an, on a very basic and simple level what confirmation bias is. Now, your brain is doing that with the majority of things all the time because whenever you're presented with information that um, isn't really necessary to your survival or is deeply important and, and philosophically foundational principles, you don't really need to worry about things. So your brain just kind of puts it on the back burner and it's like, ah, yep, that doesn't, whatever, we're going to put that in this category over here and just not even think about it. That guy's stupid, that guy's wrong, moving on. And that's confirmation bias. That's an example of it, and you can now go onto your social media and you'll find people doing this all the time, and you can have fun pointing it out to them, to which they will probably be confused, and uh, that's always more fun than starting fights anyway. So feel free to go out there and confuse people. The second example I have here is what's called the Dunny-Kruger effect. This is a terrifying one. So <laughs> this one uh, is actually the basis of a, a terrifying curse uh, that people tend to fall under that I've been trying to figure out a way to break for a large chunk of my life. I, I lived with someone that uh, suffered from the, the curse of the Dunny-Kruger effect, and I have yet to find a way to solve this problem. But... The Dunning-Kruger effect essentially means is the less skilled and less informed you are about a topic, the more that you think you are informed about the topic and the more intelligent you think you are. Um, or I'm sorry, that, that was uh, spoken incorrectly. The less you know about a something, the more you think that that thing is very simple and basic to do. It also applies to intelligence. So essentially, the more intelligent you think you are, the less intelligent you probably are. And it's a very scary uh, system. And this is, you've seen it through, talked about in the Bible and history throughout time. The wiser you get, the more you realize you don't know um, that concept. That's, in essence, the Dunning-Kruger effect. What makes this really scary, the, the curse element of it is when someone's identity is founded in being intelligent, which you never do, it's a, it's a foolish thing, but when you make being intelligent your religion, if you will, and you suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect, you essentially lock yourself in an infinite loop where you can never become smarter, you can never learn more, because 
I, you aren't smart and you aren't well educated and you aren't knowledgeable. So, but your identity is founded in being intelligent. So what you do is you go and say, well, no one else could know more than me because I am very smart. Therefore, other people can't teach me because I'm smarter than them. And so you can't be taught so you can't learn that you're stupid so that you can't be taught so you learn that you it just keeps going and going and going and you never grow and it, it locks you into a state where you can never develop it's, it's very tragic very common on reddit uh reddit people fall into this all the time uh it's a very sad trait but um this is the curse and i i, I hope to one day learn how to break it my god we have 57 people listening about Cognitive biases on a Friday night. <laughs> I have so much hope for the world. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> the the third bias here. Uh, welcome, welcome, Parliament of Owls. You guys are incredible. So, the third bias that I have here is called the attentional bias. This is a really cool one. So, if you want a great example of someone who's an expert at using an attentional bias, Donald Trump, our president, is fantastic at exploiting the attentional bias. So the attentional bias basically means that the more that you see a message, regardless of whether or not you like it or not, will um, you will be drawn to that answer. <laughs> like, you know what? So if you go and say, Donald Trump is racist, Donald Trump is horrible, Donald Trump is blah, blah, blah. The fact that you are saying his name repeatedly over and over and over again gives him a statistical advantage well above everyone else because his name has been mentioned significantly more. So the reason he does the things that he does, and, and keep in mind, the man is a persuasion genius. It, it is incredible. Um, but... Uh, yeah, he puts magicians to shame. I've seen him create things that magicians will spend like three months designing for an act. He just comes up with like in five minutes on the spot while on stage. Like It's, it's incredible. Um, but he's designing these controversial messages to get you guys talking about him so that his message, the message that he wants to get through gets repeated enough and then the, the attention is drawn to him and his message prevails. So that's uh, something to take into consideration. Now, you might be sitting there, and I hear you. I hear you guys. I feel you. Because I've, I've banned. I've banned a lot of people. So I know what my, cri <laughs> I know what my critics, critics are saying. Well, of course, Tyler. We all know this. We know that people are fallible. We know that people are so easy to manipulate and persuade. You see... Well, actually, <clears throat> we've discovered science. Exactly. Exactly. We have science, guys. Come on. I have obviously overlooked the fact that there's this thing called science. My goodness. How did I how did I fail to see science? What could that possibly be? You know what? I should probably review the scientific method, don't you think? I should probably catch myself up with because clearly I had a major blind spot called the scientific uh, method. Let, let's go over it. Okay, very, very brief recap in case you haven't taken eighth grade science in a while. Um, and if you did, you were probably taught that uh, this is racism. Anyway, <laughs> screw the education system. Do not go to college. Uh, homeschool your kids. All right. Always got to plug that message. The scientific method here I've got broken down. You uh, start by asking a question, also known as a hypothesis. You then go and find background research. Background research is what have other people done to uh, research the question that you have? Perhaps other people have already answered it. You would then construct a hypothesis. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a step there. So your question is your question. Your research basically tells you what people have said about the, question, the research. If you research the research and you find that they have not answered the question that you have, you then construct a hypothesis my apology um you will then create a test a test is where you control one variable about your question and there there's a, a whole wide range of tests like just ungodly amounts but at its most basic uh you control a variable test one thing and um make sure that the test is repeatable and something that you could have a third party replicate so from there, 
you're going to uh, see what happens. And this doc diagram I found here actually isn't exactly accurate. Dis procedure working, it's eh, um, not not the best way of wording it because you, you do the test and then you collect the data and then you see it's not whether it's working or not. It's more um, is it is are you controlling the variables correctly? Because that's that's more the fault that would occur. But anyway, once you've done that, the data is produced and you draw the conclusions. Now it's important to note here, the data is analyzed and then you draw conclusions. It's not, is this data correct or not? Because you can't, it's, it's neutral. It's just, this is what is, that's important. From there, the data is uh, sent over into databases. That's this yellow blob over here on the right, um, which you can then basically filter into the other background research. So you become part of the background research known as the peer reviewed process. And then from there, you uh, find out was your hypothesis correct? Was your hypothesis not correct? If it was correct, awesome, that's sweet. Um, it doesn't really mean much though, because you need to go have other people uh, experiment it or maybe you find out your um, the data was negative and that's cool too that doesn't really mean much either until other people replicate it especially people who disagree with you either way and that's where this big little red box at the bottom here called communicate results comes into play so once you've had your question seen what other people have to say about your question constructed a formulaic question, uh, a, a basically a well-informed question, a hypothesis, you construct a test, you conduct the test, you take the results of that test, based on the test results, you take that data, you publish that data, and you communicate it to the community so that other people can then test your test. Brief recap. Recap. <laughs> recap of the scientific method. It's a solid system. It really is. This is this is a really solid methodology for um, identifying objects and objective truth hypothetically in an environment. If you were in a vi if this was a simulation, you know, let's let's go Mr. Elon Musk here. Um, if we were in a simulation, this would be a very good system for identifying the objects and material that uh, or the, the the objects and interactions you could interact with in a game so like if you dropped into Skyrim right now this would be a good system for identifying how you can use all the different materials in the world and categorize them within the video game of Skyrim this wouldn't tell you anything about the people who sat on their desk eating Cheetos making Skyrim though um, important to note there however the problem is this system works hypothetically, but it needs to be done by humans. And humans, as we mentioned earlier, have this weird tendency to hallucinate. They're also very susceptible to manipulation. They're also very susceptible to being fooled very, very easily. They also are very susceptible to being bribed. And that is the system that we actually have to look at. For example, hypothetically speaking, There, gotta get my notes. There we go. I just kind of dropped off the map there. I need uh, I need dual monitors. <laughs> um, this this is a possible way, hypothetically, of course, because you know, if, if you don't say that, they'll uh, sue you. Yes, yes. Oh, by the way, all of the sources will be in the YouTube video. If you uh, you're one of those stupid Reddit morons, um, you're like, oh, God, what? let's let's see your sources. Um, <laughs> I have so much respect for them. Um, hey, Alex, how's it going? Um, <laughs> you'll be able to see them all on YouTube and uh, see that I took from uh, both sides of the, uh, both for and against and accumulated it. So anyway, this is a potential way in which the method can break. So let's say a backer comes. This is the backer up here on the top left with bags of money. And you know what? He sells uh, supplements and he 
wants you to come up with a study that proves that his supplements make people happy. Okay. So he dumps some money to hire some scientists to do the scientific method. Well, the problem is he can dump money in, and then when data comes back at that middle stage that disagrees with what the backer says, well, we're just going to take that data and we're just going to kind of push it off to the side. We're going we're gonna to ignore that data. And then we're going to bring the data that's more in line with what we see. We're going to call it cutting out the outliers, if you will. From there, we're going to take that data, we're going to analyze that data, and then we're going to say, does it agree with the backer? Well, if the answer is no, uh, that report will not be cited. If you cite that information, if you try to recreate that study, you are blacklisted from the scientific community. You are basically blackballed. You can lose your tenure. You can lose your professor's position for citing uh, citing and trying to retest this kind of data. The data is expunged if possible. Sometimes it can't be, in which case it will then be buried by creating multiple studies with similar titles and similar names that get much more citations so that they uh, flood out the results of the other ones. If it does happen to agree with the backer and the media is able to understand what the study means, and even if they don't, they just need to kind of be able to get a good one-liner that'll go viral, and it also agrees with their agenda, that is what we call science. And that's where you have Bill Nye, the not science guy. He's not a scientist. He doesn't know much about science. In fact, he has the same degree I have in mechanical engineering. I have a degree in marketing, which is about as scientific as his. <laughs> By the way, don't go to college. It's a scam. It does not work. It is a lie and uh, they will not teach you anything of value. If the media doesn't agree with it though, it's okay to the backer. You just pass those results along to the backer who will then take that study and use it in his marketing materials and slap it on the front that says scientifically proven to increase happiness and he sells his supplements. This is, of course, all hypothetical. I'm sure this never occurs at all. This is just one way in which the scientific method could break down. You feel that, Reddit? You feel the fear? No, no, I hear what you say. Oh, well, that's all hypothetical. Of course it's hypothetical because you don't have a real example. The scientists are the noble ones. Well, the wizards have been predicting this for centuries. And this is Gandalf. And he's not mad at you, Reddit. He just expected better. Okay? <laughs> but <laughs> the, wiz <laughs> the wizard philosophy has been talking about how you guys can't not that you can't, but the, the truth is really, really, really hard to find. It's extremely difficult, and it's even more difficult to find truth that you can then replicate with another person. And, and the best that most people will ever be able to hope for is predictability. And I hear you, and you're saying, well, okay, this is all hypothetical. You have, what examples do you have? This is, science is the new religion. You don't understand. We take this very seriously. This would never happen. Science can't be corrupted like that. Well, the reproducibility crisis, okay? The reproducibility crisis is the, um, <laughs> the factual, documented, and observed fact by scientists that uh, peer-reviewed studies were just recently um, examined for reproducibility. It means whether or not they are accurate and true. Across the spectrum of all fields, 48% of peer-reviewed studies were reproducible. And that's allowing for hard sciences. That's physics. That's uh, everything from physics to psychology, which is a soft science, not as uh, legitimate to uh, hydrology <laughs> I get the study of water all of them cumulatively the body of science that you base your factual objective world on only 48% of them were reproducible in fact some of the fields were so low that they were reproducible at a 20% rate let that sink in.
what what does that what does that mean? Can can I? I'll, I'll give you a metaphor. Not even a metaphor. I'll give you an example. What that means <laughs> is, if you pulled a random study from um, from the peer reviewed literature that said uh, studies find that for your gender, age, and height, eggs are healthy for you and will um, make you lose weight. I wouldn't say make you healthy, by the way. I'd say make you lose weight, but just just simplifying the terms here. Well, if you found that peer-reviewed study and uh, you took a coin and you said, heads, eggs are healthy for me and will help me lose weight. Tails, eggs are not healthy for me and they will not help me lose weight. And you flipped it. The coin would be more accurate than the scientific research paper. Welcome to the Church of Science, my friends. Everyone is religious. Everybody is following some sort of religion. It's just that some people don't realize it. This is the religion of science, and no one wants to be in the religion of science. They're they're a bunch of fools. Look at look at look at him. Look at that sad man with his Cheetos and his Mountain Dew. The fake scientist floating in the background. I guess he's not fake. He's he's. He's really annoying. <laughs> he says a lot of things that aren't true, which is pretty scientific if you think about it, since the 40, 50 50 chance that anything they say is right. Uh, Bill Nye saves the world, another fake scientist. He's, he's not a scientist at all. And of course, how could you be more intellectual than the <laughs> philosophical work of Richard Dawkins? <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful. He has his, his, his crushing critique of religious thought with uh, slanderous and ad hominem attacks for endless pages. So what's the answer? Well, obviously, <laughs> if I had the answer for you, um, you would have heard about it by now because I'm not that bright. I just am reading wizard philosophy. I read people who are much smarter than me. Um, but wizards have been debating this question for centuries, and it essentially breaks down into two schools of thought. There's the uh, no logos crowd and the logos crowd. It's very simple. Logos, as we discussed earlier, is essentially a super super truth, to put it bluntly. Um, truth. There's what is true. Logos is the truth. Logos is the light and the way in Christian full in in the Christian faith. Um, it is the meaning of reality. It is the the uh, the spark of the soul. And then there's the um, no logos path, which is that, that that doesn't exist. So let me see here. Let me just uh, make sure we got to drop some bands. Do we need to ban anyone? No, no, no. We're good. We're good. Um. So. Oh, sorry, got a little distracted there. All right, so we, we don't need to ban anybody. Sweet. So you have the Logos and the No Logos crowds. So what what do they mean? So the both wizard schools believe that it's very, very, very difficult to find truth, that we see the world through a dark lens, that what is reality is, what we perceive as reality is just a small sliver of reality and there's um infinite amount of data that's outside our perception that we can't reach it's this intangible void now the no logos crowd believes that there is nothing to find it is just void there is just void and if there and and they we are perceiving infinite void the logos school of thought believes that there is mostly void <laughs> there's a, and it and maybe that void has meaning and we just can't perceive what that meaning is in the same way we can't see the same colors as bees but we believe that there that void is worth exploring because within there we can find the outlines of truth and that truth is important real and the most important thing that we have, and that is logos. And so we explore the world through science, through art, 
through um, religion to try and find that truth, and that's the school of Logos thought. I'll give you a brief overview of both schools right here, as well as what those look like culturally, philosophically, and um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get right into it. <laughs> so, no logos. So, the no logos school basically thinks that there is no truth and that you make your own reality. You may have heard this a lot. It's very popular with New Age philosophy, um, and, which is just thinly veiled Satanism, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> If you, and the thought is that if you can make your own reality, well, you get to make your own morality. And if you make your own morality and you make your own reality, you are your own God. And that is the No Logos school of thought. Here are some examples of that philosophy, culturally speaking. Uh, the culture of No Logos, the religious beliefs of the No Logos uh, is nearly identical to satanism you have satan over here looking uh sound sad and downtrodden as he should be he is the fallen one after all um but that is the philosophy of no logos uh or religion i should say of no logos it's the the worship of the self now most people don't actively call themselves satanists um but that is what the religion is I and mean, they might put government as their god or they might put the greatest good as their god or they might put themselves as their god but the idea of Satanism is that you can be your own god or choose your own god, and that's um, you can choose like what is your h highest good. That is the the essence of Satanism itself. Culturally, uh, Rick and Morty is a great example of in pop culture of what no logos is in like a fantasy world kind of way. Rick is a perfect example of someone who subscribes to this philosophy of there is no truth. There is nothing. It's just you make your own reality. Um, perfect example of it. And the most um, popular and absolute garbage trash philosopher, not worth reading, known as Nietzsche, who has never contributed anything of value to philosophy. And if you want a better summation of his philosophy, just read Ecclesiastes because it's his entire freaking book, Beyond Good and Evil, which he spent, I think it was, what? 300-ish pages writing about. The entire book is summed up in about four pages in the Bible and uh, actually answers the question that he never answers in the book Beyond Good and Evil because he is a terrible philosopher. He has nothing of value to contribute and he was a psychotic schizophrenic. That's Nietzsche, the founder of this philosophy. You guys may know from my backstory that I, I hate Nietzsche with a passion. He's not a philosopher. I will not accept him. That being said... He is the most popular and recognized philosopher of this No Logos philosophy. It's very difficult to find people that have this philosophy because um, most people in this culture just use temptation and manipulation from Satan uh, to bribe them into believing it and then just use pseudoscientists to try and back it up like Richard Dawkins and um, Sam Harris. They just, they skip the philosophy part. So now there's the Logos school. So the Logo School believes that there is truth, and we are servants to it. We, we are obligated to be subservient to truth. Even if what I want is affected by the truth, the truth must come above what I want. The truth is the source of what is and isn't moral. I don't get to decide what is and isn't moral. Uh, the truth, the Logos, decides what's true and moral. The truth comes from Logos, and Logos is God. And that is the difference between Logos and no Logos. You don't get to be your own God. There is a God. That's the difference. The culture of Logos, uh, the most common, uh, the religion that worships Logos, it's actually the only religion that worships Logos, is Christianity. Uh, worships the Logos, the Alpha, the Omega, the Light, the True, the Way. Um, the the word that is Christianity. So from a religious perspective, if you're looking for a religion that worships truth, worships logos, that is Christian faith. If you're looking for a pop culture that is very founded in logos, the Lord of the Rings series, uh, Tolkien basically wrote the Lord of the Rings as a uh, way for children to kind of um, adopt the Christian mythos before they took the next step to the Bible itself. So before you start taking it more seriously, that, that was um, 
somewhat of his intentions with the mythos. So you can reading the Lord of the Rings, which is arguably one of the greatest uh, works of literature, fictional literature ever written, um, is a great example if you want to get uh, deep in logos mythology and uh, mentality, the, the culture, if you will. And then finally, the uh, there's two philosophers here. Um, the first one has to go to Aristotle because I mean he's literally the philosopher. Like <laughs> he was such a good philosopher that for a huge chunk of history, all other philosophers were no longer referred to as philosophers. He was just called the philosopher. There was one of them. He got it right. The end. <laughs> That's Aristotle. But if you're looking for someone, because trust me, guys, I, I I've been reading Aristotle. And there's probably a lot of you out here in that. There's 58. 50 58 people here right now um there's probably a lot of you that are much smarter than me so maybe you're able to read aristotle and just like get it quick and read it but man i have to sit down for a long long time reading him very carefully and it it's a it's tough for me to process what he's thinking so if you're looking for someone that um who's extraordinarily intelligent far more intelligent than i am as well but um more modern day language more simplistic ideas c.s lewis mere christianity fantastic example of logos uh philosopher as well um just c.s lewis as a philosopher in general is um it's a lot easier to understand more modern day language and he writes with the understanding that people aren't as bright as they used to be. <laughs> so, so he makes it a little easier to understand. It's still complicated works, but um, it, it's, it's very powerful. I, I really like Mere Christianity because he did it with the intention of reaching normal people. So if you're looking for philosophical logos, that's it. So what this boils down to is two schools of thought. And it all boils down to one long war. Uh, there isn't all these little separate wars. There's one big war. And it's been a war that's been going on throughout all of recorded history, which is between the Logos school and the no-Logos school. That's the battle that goes on. Religiously speaking, this is Jesus versus Satan. This is the Christians versus Satan. This is God versus Satan. Uh, that dynamic going back and forth. The people who want to be their own gods and the fact that there is a God, there is a truth. In pop culture, you see this referenced in 300. The st Spartans who stand for truth and freedom and principles and the hordes of the no logos people who just push and push and push. That's it in pop culture and philosophically all boiling down to Plato versus Aristotle, the belief exemplified by these two philosophers. It's all boiling down to this this constant war of back and forth. And quite frankly, the um, Logo School is much smaller. It's, it's a much smaller school. Uh, it's shrinking all the time because it is constantly being attacked and destroyed and ridiculed and um, mass manipulation attacks against it from the no logo school because the no logos doesn't believe that there is morality and if you don't believe there's morality you can be a liar you can be manipulative you can do evil because it's not evil it's just what's advantageous to them and they get to choose what is moral um but you know what the logo school started with 12 guys and uh we've got 54 here so <laughs> we're doing good we're doing good um, sorry, skip there real quick. So that's, that's what's going on. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the, this, the wizard philosophies. So there's two wizard philosophies, the no logos and the logos, and everyone is religious. So at the end of this lecture here, I'm just going to boil everything down to some key principles for you, because as I mentioned, when you learn something, uh, you need to be able to distill it down to its key principles, find things that you can apply in your everyday life and figure out what mistakes you can now avoid by getting that knowledge. If you don't get those things, you haven't been educated, you've been manipulated and de-educated. You'll find this happening very frequently in college. Don't go to college. It is a scam. Never go. They are evil. Colleges are evil. And I can say that because I believe in logos. <laughs> that being said, let's do some education. So the key principles, everyone has a religion. Pick one or one will pick you. This is very crucial. You can't just not have a religion. You think you can have no religion, but if you don't, then 
you will pick something to fill the slot of religion with. Most of the time, something else will pick you. It might be a political movement. It might be a demon. It might be uh, obsession with Star Wars. It might even be yourself. And the problem is, if you pick yourself to be the thing that you worship, you're worshiping a puny, pathetic god, and you will fail and will never be able to accomplish anything. Remember that we see the world through a glass darkly. Even the scientific approach is less than accurate, is less accurate than 50-50 chance. There are two ideas at war. There's the people who worship truth and logos and the ones that worship themselves. Those are the key principles that I wanted to instill to you guys today. Pick a religion or one will pick you. We are not confident about what truth is and we don't have a system for identifying truth very effectively at all. And with that information, realize that there's a choice that you need to make. Whether you want to accept that there is truth and it is hard to find, but it's worth pursuing, or that there isn't. That's your choices. What key behaviors can you apply? What can you apply from this knowledge? Well, first, if you find yourself being extremely certain of something, research the counterpoints for that opposing side. It's This is a useful exercise because you will find out very frequently the thing that you are very certain about, you weren't as correct as you might think. Very useful to do. The second thing that you can apply in your life is next time you get in a social media argument, instead of trying to win the argument, try to learn why the other person believes what they do. Like, what, what, learn, what is it that makes you think that? And this will be an interesting um, experiment to try because most of the time it actually leaves the person more upset because they're in a state of cognitive dissonance as well. So when you apply this tactic, it can kind of be very uh, dis disruptive. They, they might attack you personally, um, to which you should respond with just take the high ground approach. Just don't to be like, hey, you know, I don't want to argue. I, just, I really, I don't know what you're, I haven't met anybody in my social circle that thinks like this, and I really want to get to know what you think. Um, and it has to be genuine. If it's not genuine, don't, don't do it. Just block them, <laughs> ban them. Finally, I want you to, um, and obviously, uh, Wizard doesn't tell you what to do. This is all just suggestions. I don't know what's best to do with your life because it's not mine. So take this all as just suggestions. But ask yourself, does evil exist? If you think about that question long and hard, does evil exist? You'll find the right camp for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, owls. Uh, he knows what camp he's <laughs> everyone's like yes this camp yes this camp uh yeah i know you're in the logos camp nice good job i'm proud of you but if you think about it does evil exist you will find out because if if evil exists then truth exists because morality exists and if morality exists truth exists and if truth exists logos exists and if logos exists god exists so ask yourself does evil exist and follow that train of thought key mistakes to avoid don't get lost in meta truth and rabbit holes okay now i do this it's okay to do if you're experienced with it and can have fun and detach from it um just like to spin around with the ideas kind of like the the no earth society people <laughs> when we were trolling them during the live streams but um people have a tendency to waste the precious time and effort and energy to try and find truth about things that either they a will never be able to get the truth about or b finding the truth about doesn't impact them in any meaningful way save your pursuits of truth for things that are pragmatically advantageous to yourself don't get lost in meta truth don't get lost in rabbit holes don't worry about finding the truth for things that aren't important did han solo shoot first I mean, probably, who knows? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Not worth wasting your time. Is the Earth a circle or a square or a triangle or an interdimensional worm? It doesn't matter. I 
don't care. That's the proper response. Secondly, don't make it personal. There's about a 90% chance that something I've said in this presentation has upset you personally. Just don't take it personal. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about ideas. And I'm talking about the wizard philosophy. I'm giving you an example. And I'm not saying that I'm even right. I'm just telling you what I believe. This is the belief that I have and what I study. And what I study may be wrong. And I plan to continue to learn and develop my philosophy. And I hope that you will too. And the third mistake to avoid is just don't worry about it too much. Nobody knows. Everyone is religious. Everything requires faith. No, anyone who claims that they isn't the truth, that they don't have, that they have the 100% truth, is insane. You don't need to follow that. Everyone requires faith. The difference is, people who are religious are honest about it. A Christian will tell you that they need faith. A person from the Church of Science, not so much. Everyone has faith. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's my last piece of advice. So finally, thank you for joining us, everybody. If you liked this presentation, if this was helpful for you, please like, share, and subscribe, but only if you enjoyed this class. If not, please leave a comment on how I can improve. If you didn't, so that I can get better. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, want to talk about this, feel free to discuss it amongst yourselves as well in the... <laughs> What are you talking about? You, uh, I will. I will in just a second. Uh, in the comment section right now, and I will go through them, and I will respond to them all. And next time, if you guys could, I, I know you're in the cult, and I know the owls in the parliament like to DM me through Insta gr uh, Instagram, and I know you hate Facebook, and they're stealing your data, blah, blah, blah. Please drop it in the comment section of Facebook, or at least YouTube, once this gets uploaded to YouTube. Because going through the Instagram comments is very difficult. Okay. And uh, with that, thank you all for joining. And let's answer some... Oh, what's going on here? Let's answer some questions. Hey, TJ. How's it going? Focus is rising. <laughs> Facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> That's, I don't know what that's in reference to, but okay. I mean, I, obviously, I think that's Ben Shapiro's, like, line, right? I'm glad that you enjoyed my act. Thank you. Uh, you can go to askawizardmagic.com to get free magic lessons. It's under the free magic lessons section. I will be performing my next show um, Tuesday, Magic Castle. You can email me at touchingonmagic at gmail.com if you're interested in going. The uh, availability goes out fast because I can only get four other people in. So you probably will get back logged a couple of months. But you can. <laughs> and, 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 you, and I will. No, I'm not going to kill myself. <laughs> Banned for life. And no, that's not an ad hominem attack on science. It's uh... okay. The reproducibility study, which all of the sources will be in the YouTube video. You can check them out for yourself, moron. Um, <laughs> this isn't me saying this. This is not my opinion. This is what scientists are saying about their own studies. The most biased group that exists for this particular thing are saying this. This is not my opinion. This isn't what I think. Here, you want? Know Here is a quote unquote opinion because it's been ob. Uh, this has been hidden. This is uh, this is hypothetical. This is hypothetically how you could break a system hypothetically this is science admitting that it breaks down more than 50 percent of the time it's less accurate than a coin flip scientist 
are saying it. It is a crisis. The, there are people who are theorizing that the scientific method or scientific peer-reviewed process is being attacked by terrorists because it is so bad. Some studies are reproducing less than 10%, not 20%. I put the more conservative estimate. Some are estimating less than 10%. 90% of them are not reproducible. You're wrong. Look into it. <laughs> and with that, everybody, go out there. Ask yourself, does evil exist? And decide what camp you're on. My name's Tyler Sass. You can follow me at, at AskAWizard. And uh, check me out at the Magic Castle. If you'd like any magic shows, go to AskAWizardMagic.com. You know what to do. Thanks for joining. Peace.